we are officially starting. This is Daniel Throssel. I'm Sean McIntyre, and I'm just going to let him give his own credibility reel because he's definitely better at it than me. I'm an email copywriter, basically. And I effectively worked for a few years at one of Australia's largest investing newsletters called the Barefoot Blueprint. I helped Australian author Scott Pape launch the best-selling book in Australian history. So I wrote the launch funnel for that. So that was a cool thing I did. And currently I have um, my own email list or I do daily emails sort of in the email marketing space. So I did work for about four years as a copywriter in the financial space. I did a lot of other work as well. In fact, I worked on Upwork for a long time. I've actually worked with financial publishers in Australia. Everybody is constantly asking about like, how do they get their foot in the door? It was a little bit roundabout. I was an engineer working for Chevron and I was fly in, fly out. And I was on this remote island, two hours flight offshore in the middle of the sea, tiny little island. There was a gas plant on it. It was like miserable. There's red dirt everywhere. It was humid and sweaty. And I hated this place. And I used to follow Ramit Sethi, you know, from yeah. I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Yep. Um, I think he's pretty well known. And he ran a contest when he launched his copywriting course in 2015, I think it was. He launched a contest, write a sales letter to promote my course. And because I'd been following him, I was like, I, I don't know what copywriting is. I, I'd never heard the word copy in the sense other than copy paste kind of. I didn't know it could refer to words. And so he's like, write a sales letter for my copywriting course. And I was like, I have no flipping idea what a sales letter is. I don't know what copywriting is, but I like Ramit and I like his emails. So I'll give that a try. I can write stuff. I think because I didn't know what copywriting was, there was a lot of guys who went into this challenge and they did the whole learn how to 2x, 5x, 10x your business with the secret power that could make you money. You know, like, they were right. doing all those things. I'm reading their entries because they're public. And I was like, oh man, I can't do that. And so I took this totally weird approach to it, which was like, well, I'm just going to tell a story. And I'd never read a copywriting book in my life. Didn't know what it was. I, I don't think I was even Googling how to do it. I was just like, I'm going to do my own thing. And I wrote this thing. It was like, how I got my wife to let me buy a $200 ebook, right? And I told this story of how, I, how Ramit had sold me one of his books. And I was like, that's copywriting. And I won. I won Ramit's contest with that. The first ever piece of copy I'd written. And I remember sitting there in the office, like, like this, literally with an earphone press. And I was late for a meeting out on the site to inspect some cables. I'm listening to his webinar and he like says, and Daniel Thrustle's won. And I nearly screamed in the middle of the office. That was my first exposure to this copywriting thing. Admittedly, kind of a lucky break. Like not everyone's like, you win a contest from someone who's very high up with your first ever piece of coffee, but I got lucky with that. And so I spoke to Ramit. That was one of the prizes. Like you get to speak to him for half an hour about copy. And he's like, so tell me what you want to know about copywriting. And I was like, how could I do this as a career? Like I've never written copy before. And he's like, you've never written copy before. And he's like, oh, he was expecting a totally different conversation. He was like, oh boy. It's like, okay, here's what you got to do. I found out about Upwork, probably from something through Ramit's emails. And I went on Upwork and started trying to win work there. And I was doing this thing where I would write a custom sample just for, for the job. So if they, they said they wanted this article, I'd write a similar article to what they wanted and submit it. And the first ever job I won was writing product descriptions for beard oils. You know, as you can see my beard, it's better than yours. Um, <laughs> naturally, naturally. Yeah, so. Uh, and I got translucent. I, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's the oils, man. That's what it is, the beard it, oils. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's beard a spiritual beard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I started working there and I, I did really well on Upwork, just, you know, doing a good job. I was reading a lot of books at this time because I'd started figuring out this, this was a copywriting thing, this cool thing. So I'm starting to Google some, you know, some John Carlton, Bob Bly. Those were two names that Ramit gave me to study. And over the next year or so, I started raising my rate, getting more experience. And I sort of worked my way in that way. So Upwork was a really great way in for me. And eventually at the end of that year, I was approached by uh, Scott Pape, who was at the time a very well-known Australian financial commentator. And he contacted me. He's like, hey, I need your help with some copy. And that copy turned out to be the launch funnel for a book he was about to launch. And that book subsequently became the best-selling book in Australian history over the next few years. Uh, it was actually this, this you know, it's a finance book. And I think 
we might talk about that a bit later. So writing that for him and, you know, that writing those emails to launch that book, it went really well. And then he brought me on to start helping him with other stuff. And because he had this newsletter as well, this financial newsletter, eventually, you know, he started uh, getting my help with that. So first I came on just to do like uh, overflow copy needs, I guess, and help him with stuff that he couldn't handle. And then eventually like, he was like, well, I've got this newsletter business and he was running it with a really small team. And so slowly I started to get assimilated into that. And, you know, over the next year or two, I was basically the head of operations, worked my way up to the head of operations there. I was in all the content we did, you know, it wasn't just the sales copy, you know, I was doing the sales copy too, but also content and research and editorial. So customer retention, all of it. That's what I did for the next four or so years before kind of, uh, you know, striking out on my own. Uh, he, he eventually decided to close down the newsletter, just wanted to change the pace. It was doing very well. So uh, it was just a lifestyle thing for him. But did yeah, that, that ends, if I may ask. Actually, we didn't. So that's... Um, That'll kill we, a business. <laughs> it, well, the business was actually doing really well. The, and the yeah. final year when we shut it down was the best year he'd had. But I think it was like, it, he is a really like family man kind of guy, mm. had kids. And one of the things about the industry, I guess the finance industry, I don't want to say too much bad about it is like, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who go into it and they're not ready. There's a lot of copy out there that's kind of on the edge that they just want to get people in. And one of the things that we were finding is that as we got big, there, there was mum and dads, people who'd never invested before, retirees and so on. They're like, well, I don't know anything about investing. These are kind of people who probably never touch a Motley Fool or yeah. a, an Agora newsletter. But they're like, well, I like your brand because I've read your book. And they're joining the newsletter. And then suddenly these people are starting to try and buy stocks. And they're not and ready like $1, for thousand dollars to invest like other right. life savings. And, yeah. and they're not, they're not ready for it. They're not ready to invest. They don't get that, you know, you put it in and it can go down as well yeah. as up. And so that was sort of one reason I think he wanted, he's like, I don't really want to be the person who's responsible for that sort of thing. We really did in our marketing play off against a lot of those other brands because they were doing things like that, that, that we weren't doing, you know, there is sort of a trend in, in the industry. At least there was like, you know, it's been a two years or so since I was doing this. But when we were competing it there, there were just more and more offers. Like there's, you go in, there's upsell after upsell after upsell. And then they get you in on the platinum package. And then there's the lifetime portfolio, pay $5,000. And there's just, you know, a $500 annual maintenance fee to keep the lights on. And it was all about money. And part of me is like, as a copywriter and as a marketer, I get it. You know, these are the things that we talk about in our copywriting groups and forums and say, you know, this is how you can maximize your revenue. So I get it. I'm not like, I'm more sympathetic to that than most people. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there were people who were like, you know, just falling prey to this. And we, you know, we didn't really like it. So we kind of operated as kind of a, a counter force to that in the Australian market. I think we ended up stopping it because like, we were just like, we just don't want to play in that sandbox anymore and so i i haven't really been in the space as much for the last year or so i totally got out of the financial copywriting market and now i'm in the email copywriting industry building my own brand the kind of copy i've been writing over the last year what i found to be super effective is you know telling people being blatantly uh, with, with blatant candor and saying you know, it's probably not for you like you, you you actually shouldn't buy this unless it's not like I've split tested to a massive degree, run one sales letter that's done the big promises and one that hasn't, you know, I've just done the candor, but it's worked really well. My own business has been incredibly profitable and the quality of customer you get is really good and you can sleep well at night too. One of the things that I notice in juniors is copy voice, use car salesman kind of writing. And I actually went in going through your materials and researching for this interview, I noticed you actually put out like a little mini podcast, a little video where you were talking about the inauthentic sounding copy. And I was wondering if you wanted to riff on that. That I first sales letter I wrote, yeah, it was kind of fresh and non-salesy. And then I read all the books and my writing got salesier. And I remember one of the first things I did for my client, it was um, writing him a New Year's Eve sale or something. And I turned in these emails and I thought they were fantastic. I'd stayed up till 2 a.m. doing this funnel. And he, like, he was a really great copywriter. And he got back to me and he's like, you're a really good 
but this stinks. And I've read them since, like four years later in hindsight. And I was like, this sounds like Amway sales copy. It was terrible. And so it was kind of like I went through this, you know, a newbie not polluted by it. And then it was into that hardcore salesmanship and, you know, had to spend years climbing my way back out of that ditch. One of the big things that I find, I totally agree with you, is that a lot of new writers will, you know, they try and avoid, uh, adopt sales copy voice. And I found that even when I started my brand, I was very influenced by other people. Like my early emails sounded like other brands that I like, like Ben Settle or whatever. And it, you know, it was not super authentic. And as I sort of channeled more into myself and my own style and my own voice, not only was I more confident in writing it, but people started responding to it really differently. You know, people will say, you know, I've, I've never read copy like yours before. You know, where did you learn to write like that? How do you do that? The more I've tried to not sound like a copywriter and sometimes actively mock that stuff, they can't think beyond a checklist. They can't think beyond a template. They can't think beyond a swipe file. That kind of thing is going to put you in, in the path of being bulldozed by an AI that gets really good, frankly. Because yeah. an AI is going to be a lot better at large-scale data collection and following a template than you are. And so ironically, that's, I think, been a big strength of mine is being able to be surprising and funny and full of personality where, where people aren't expecting and do weird things in my emails, break conventions, mock conventions. The more I do that, the more popular I get.